Welcome to Game Theorem, where we have serious discussions about absurd entertainment. I'm Kyle. I'm Kira. And today for this episode, I was thinking that Kira and I could do a bit of a skit for you guys before we get into it. All right. So Kyle, have you learned anything from our podcast so far? Yes, actually, I'm uh, writing a screenplay, and I'm including a gay character for diversity reasons. So does that character ever get into a relationship or say that they're gay to someone? Well, it's never explicitly said that they're... So they're not gay. Well, it's like subtly implied throughout their interactions. Uh, between... Yeah, that's not representation. Well, maybe it kind of... No. No, it's not. <laughs> and that's basically the, uh, the topic we're going to be talking about today. Yes, we're going to be talking about the trope called, we call, barely gay characters. And this is a trope where a character seems gay or is said to be gay, and the writers, for whatever reason, don't follow through on this. And some examples of this include, like, a character is just said to be gay outside of the actual canon um, material, <clears throat> J.K. Rowling. Or, for example, like, they'll have a very good relationship with another character of the same sex. And it will seem very positive and healthy, but they just never officially date. Or sometimes they'll have a character who is said to be gay, a, a very well-rounded character, yet is never seen in any type of uh, gay relationship. And so it seems like you don't have to have well-rounded out characters. Sometimes you can have background characters where they just don't care about this. But it seems a little obvious when you have characters that are rounded out and fleshed out in every way except for their orientation. It's like a glaring hole in their character design. Mm -hmm. And, for example, there will be a bi character that just never gets an actual same-sex relationship. And or they're at least written in such a way that it really pushes the hetero side of things. It ends up treating the fact that they're like, oh, you also like women as a uh, or I guess uh, I'm imagining a female or, or you also like men. Like it pushes it as like a cherry on top that hetero is still the default. Mm -hmm. And another thing with bisexuality is the reason they do that a lot of the time is because there's this, there's this dichotomy where if you're with a man or if you're with a person of the same sex when you're bisexual, you've picked a side, you're actually gay. Or if you're a person with the opposite sex, then you're some kind of traitor or something. Well, that kind of falls in line with the trope of uh, gay, straight, or lying. Yes. And that a lot of people simply don't believe that bi is a thing. Which is not true. Anyway, that plays into pra the practice of queer baiting, where writers will say that they have a gay character or hint at a relationship and just never follow through on that relationship. Well, see, what we're talking about barely gay characters is the entire trope. Like, it's like an overarching umbrella trope. Yes. What you're talking about there, that's when it's done manip like maliciously. Yes, when exactly. When it's used to manipulate the audience. They're taking advantage of that. Whereas sometimes it's done and the writers just literally don't understand the mistakes they're making. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between the two. But queer baiting is malicious in that it will try to attract an LGBT audience by insinuating that their character is LGBT. Like and marketing then, it that way. Yeah, just marketing it that way. And then not following through on giving a positive representation of whichever orientation they choose to have as their character. Or any representation. Yes, honestly, any representation. Because there's a lot of the... I feel like sometimes it's even like after the fact, you know? Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, But no, there's sometimes like a show will be running for a long time. And then like partway through the show, they're like, wait a minute. Our show's kind of whitewashed. Uh, we should add some diversity to this. And this takes place within all kinds of different types of diversity, including with gay characters. What would be an example of that? Like, I, I... Borderlands. Borderlands is a immediate example. Oh, yeah, where, you're right. I mean, we talked about Borderlands uh, last episode, but uh, most of the original playable characters were as like hetero as can be. 
And then only later did they actually add in some other characters that were that way because they realized they had kind of been missing the mark for a while. Yeah, and even after that, they didn't really flesh out those characters and explicitly say they were their orientation until... Uh, like Tales from the Borderlands. And Marvel does the same thing. I do not think it's a coincidence that Black Panther was literally the last uh, solo Marvel superhero movie to be released before their big Avengers climax. Yeah, actually, that is really true. I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. Still waiting on that Black Widow movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, honestly, it would be great if they would include some Russian culture and actually do a movie with Black Widow. She has red hair. Yeah. Yeah. Forget, I don't know her backstory. <laughs> um, anyway, the trope. <laughs> <laughs> well. Come on, you, you, you have some other stuff to say. Kira has been, like, she's taking point on this episode because she has a personal investment in this particular trope because she sees it all over the place. Oh, yes. Not only do I see it all over the place, but I am bisexual. So it's very hard for me to see these characters and just kind of be okay with it. <laughs> yeah, especially considering the way that you know bi people are portrayed. Oh, yes, and we will get in more into that later with a very specific representation of a bisexual character. And th- this is why uh, Kira is taking point on this particular episode. As a you know somewhat hetero guy, I have less to contribute to the conversation, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually I was actually a little bit nervous about this episode. Well, I still think that you have something to contribute as a ally and also, you know, our I, relationship. I just want to stress that I'm trying my best to not offend anybody. <laughs> I don't I don't want to come across as like telling everybody what to do or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah okay, I'm just going to I'm just going to be quiet now. Um <laughs> Uh, Kara, you had some examples for us? Oh, yes. I have plenty of examples in this trope. And the one that gets me almost, almost the one that gets me the most hated is Sherlock. And this is the BBC version with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin mm. Freeman. Okay, yeah. And you know we've talked about this stuff uh, off mic before. So, Kira, I think what you should do with this example, I understand why it really grinds your gears. Mm-hmm. But I think you need to first make your case about how they are obviously gay. Like, some people might disagree with this. Some some of our listeners, you may not agree with this, but uh, Kira, I think, can really make this case. So do that, and then you can talk about how they violate this trope. That That's, I mean, I think that's the best way to go about it. You know what? I agree with you. Okay, so the case for Sherlock being gay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the theory that John Watson is bisexual. Oh, wait, do you have to worry about spoilers? Oh, yes. Spoilers. For Sherlock. How much? <laughs> um, There is some specific stuff I'm going to bring up. So not like specific plot points in the actual plot, but stuff that okay, happens. We, we won't be just talking about Sherlock, though. So listeners, you could get off here or you can just kind of go like la 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 for our, like, I don't know, a while. <laughs> and uh, just just stop after a while and you'll, you'll be good. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Anyway, so in the very first episode of this modern interpretation of the Sherlock Holmes stories, I feel like that's important to say that this is a modern interpretation. So it happens in modern London. Oh, it does? Yes. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a mo- I, I would honestly, I wouldn't even be so mad if it wasn't a modern interpretation because then I could at least understand it being that it was so dangerous for them to even suggest that. that or it was a time where people were even more repressed than they are in the modern era. Exactly. So I feel like maybe they would have had a bit of an excuse then, but they don't because this is set in modern day London. So anyway, in the first episode of Sherlock, the first evidence that Sherlock himself is not straight is when John Watson asks him if he has a girlfriend and Sherlock replies with the following quote, no, not really my area. And that to me suggests that no matter what orientation he is, he is not into women, therefore not heterosexual. 
What about the people that would suggest that he was simply saying he doesn't have an interest in romance? I would say to that, that he clearly portrays an interest in John Watson. And it is very clear from the beginning because most people he considers too boring to even bother with. But John Watson, immediately he is attached to him. And immediately they become flatmates. They start living together. And just the way he treats John, it's immediately apparent that John isn't just another boring person to him. Okay. That he's more important than that. Okay, but what's your uh, what point would you make to support the idea that he isn't simply a brother figure? I would say to that, uh, an example of what happens right after John asks him about girlfriend. Because after that, he says, boyfriend, then, that would be okay. You know, he tries to assure Sherlock that that would be okay with him. We don't really get an answer to that. When oh, he asked is that. he like interrupted or something? I believe so. I haven't watched it in a while, but I believe it gets interrupted. But we, the point is we don't get a blatant answer to that. But just like the fact that he even asked if Sherlock is into the other sex suggests that John Watson is not entirely um, like unaware of the possibility of that. Oh, actually... What happens after that is Sherlock suggests that John is coming on to him and says that he's married to his work. And so like as if like I'm married to my work, I'm I'm not available kind of thing. Yes. Which is okay. I guess you could make the argument that then Sherlock isn't interested in romance at all. But the way he treats John Watson... It was, a, it was like a personal response. Mm -hmm. it was, he wasn't saying that about romance in general. He was saying that about the person asking him. Yes. Yes, he was. He's, he said he was flattered, but that he was married to his work. I think you should and, also just point out and consider that they literally spend the entire show together, right? Yes. Like they, are, they are partners in every sense of the word. Yes. And if, if one of the partners was a woman, you'd immediately assume that there would be, you know, romantic tension between them. Absolutely. But especially even, since they end up getting, like, lived together. But even though they're both male, you still have that tension. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, they only end up living together because they both think that no one would want to be their flatmate. And so they both kind of get connected by a friend of both of them and that is how they begin their relationship is it ever portrayed as taboo for two men to be living together um i don't believe so although to be fair their landlady mrs hudson is a fairly prominent character and often she assumes that they get into a relationship later on in the series and acts like they're a couple oh but how do they react to that John is the only one that ever reacts to that. Sherlock never says anything in response to that. That's kind of suspicious. <laughs> yes. And you know what John says? He says whenever it's insinuated that Sherlock and John are a couple, which happens fairly often in the series, that someone will assume that they're together, and John will specifically say three words. I'm not gay. Now, I believe... That also leaves room for him to be bisexual, but the fact that he does have a relationship with a woman later on in the series also suggests that he might be bisexual. But yes, he says specifically that he is not gay. And that to me is just like, why do you feel the need to defend yourself, first of all? Like, Sherlock never says anything in response to that, ever. I mean, it does seem a little bit like denial, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hate to not take his word for it, but I would find it difficult to imagine a situation where someone would freely admit to being gay in modern or Victorian times. Exactly. And the fact that he, they just assume that they're in a relationship and then he'll say he's not gay. It's just like, why don't you just 
why does it matter to you? You know? Mm -hmm. Because Sherlock never says anything about it. All right. He's perfectly happy with people assuming that they're in a relationship. I don't think your case is airtight, but I do think it's convincing enough that I'm sure you are not the only person that has come to this conclusion. Oh, God, no. The fan fiction community alone is enormous for this ship, for this relationship, because they are, like, portrayed to be almost soulmates through this series that they could only possibly uh, be with each other. And it is blatantly obvious because John has PTSD because he is a soldier. And what happens after he meets Sherlock is that he gets better. His psychological problems start to fade away after he's with Sherlock. And that, to me, suggests a deeper connection than friendship. All right. Well, I think you've made your case. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about the implications of this trope and how it would be affected to the uh, Sherlock and Watson specifically mm -hmm. as, as the first of our examples in this trope? I think that while you could make the argument that John is straight and that is reasonable because he does explicitly state that he's not gay and dates a woman in the series and marries a woman, you cannot make the same argument for Sherlock. And that in itself feels like he is, you know, an, the epitome of one of these barely gay characters because he's very much... I'm not going to say obvious. Wait, epitome? Uh, epitome. Epitome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because it is very heavily, you could very much imply that he is in love with John, even if it's not in a romantic way. And so it feels like he is basically just not given anyone else but John. And that just feels like he's not straight, but he doesn't get to be with anybody in the series. Okay, I get what you're saying, but you're going back to making your case again. Oh, I, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> and that right. is why I feel this is queer baiting and represents this trope because it is explicitly stated by Sherlock that he's not, you know, straight, that he's not into women. And I mean, at the very least, that would make him a, uh, what, what's the word for if you don't like either gender? Asexual. Yes, that. Um so at the very least, I mean, that's definitely just, you know, not hetero. Yeah, exactly. But they just don't ever explicitly state it other than that beginning episode. And he never is in a relationship with anyone else to suggest that. And yeah. But the reason you say it, uh, it falls into the trope is because... It's done manipulatively. Like, oh, like yes. the writers are very much aware of what's going on here. Explain. Oh, yes, definitely. Because people often mistake them as a gay couple. And have having John say, I'm not gay. Mm -hmm. And have in the beginning, having Sherlock state that he's not, that women aren't his area is... Would you consider that lampshading? Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, lampshading is usually a term used for like, Oh, we acknowledged it. Ha, ha, ha. Therefore, we can dismiss it. Uh, I guess so, yeah. Because it's... <sighs> I mean, it's a loose attribute, uh, a, a, a tribute, I think, a tributing of the word. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like no matter what argument you make, even if you say John okay, is okay, straight, okay. it's just... You don't have to defend anymore. You made your case. Okay. Just talk about the trope. <laughs> it's just queer baiting. Because the relationship with Sherlock and John could so obviously be beyond friendship, and they just don't acknowledge that throughout the entire series. And the fact that John ends up marrying a woman, and spoilers here, major spoilers, that woman ends up having to have lied about John about who she was the entire time, and also ends up shooting Sherlock. And John forgives her and stays with her despite what he did, what she did. And that to me just feels like they are so dedicated to this heterosexual relationship 
for the sake of heterosexuality. Yeah, because like, no matter what his uh, orientation is, fact is, is he had a very close bond with Sherlock, mm-hmm. right? And so much more of a close bond than this woman who he had met more recently, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in fact, she was the one who betrayed him and nearly killed his friend. So any person, I think, would naturally side with the friend in that situation. You know, the, the friend who could possibly be something more. Uh, so it just, it really seems like it's specifically like the writers are going out of their way, out of the character, to choose the hetero option. Because even though the, the character, Watson, would choose the person that he's had this bond with over this, this woman that betrays him, the writers violate that. And they write in the other direction. No, he must end up with the woman. He is hetero. He cannot choose the friend. He cannot choose the guy over the girl. Yes. And that is especially heinous considering John Watson's character of loyalty and dedication to his friends and his dedication to Sherlock. If I was Sherlock, I would feel like that's a betrayal. You're still dating the woman who shot me. Yes, and some other stuff happens in in relation to that. But just that, the fact that he chooses to just forgive her after that is just ridiculous. Yeah, Sherlock should be like bros before marital spouses. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, yeah, they're married and they've been together for a couple years at that point. But even that long-term relationship should be... Like, John should end that if there's a reason to. And I feel like what she did was a very reasonable way to end the relationship. He had no idea who she was. And he decided to just not know who she was before she married him. And I, that's it's awful. Okay, I think I think this has been a long enough first example. Okay, I apologize. I feel like you had a lot to get off your chest there. Yes. But, okay, this was just the first of our examples. We have other examples of how characters that are, like, either designed or written as gay, but the writers don't commit to it, okay? hmm So I have an example now, now that Kira's gone. Yes. Uh, there's this show called Lost Girl. Mm-hmm. It's a show on Netflix, and it, it's a Canadian-produced show, and it's advertised as being about a succubus, a woman who learns that she is a succubus, starring a bi character. Mm-hmm. And she has to figure out like what she is in this world of mythical creatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the hook seems kind of good and bad. Like At first I was like, succubus? I don't know, I feel it's a little pandering. But at the same time, it was an interesting premise. I was just interested to see, like, oh, would they pull off a bi character? You know, it's not often you see shows proudly... Uh, uh, proclaiming that you know yes because it explicitly says she's bisexual in the description for the show exactly uh so we decided to give it a chance and we actually really liked the show it started off in a really interesting way and they weren't afraid to show that she was bi however it didn't take that too many episodes into it to realize some of the problems they had when writing this character i'm just gonna say that it is incredibly obvious that the writers were m- male. You you want to mention the scenes of... Okay, okay. <laughs> so... Since she is bisexual, she does have relationships with female characters and does have sex with women. And these sex scenes with women are very obviously written for the male gaze. And I'm going to talk about something specifically that indicates this. The fact that both of the women in the scene seem to be very sexually excited and aroused, but all of their hands are always visible. not always, but sometimes. Yes. So... What's going on down there? Yeah. Okay, but... That, while that is problematic, it goes even further than that. Oh, yes. Be- because she has this relationship with a male character, a werewolf, of course. The most masculine werewolf you could find. Mm-hmm. And she also has a relationship with a female doctor. By the way, the werewolf is like the epitome of toxic masculinity. What, is it toxic? Epitome. 
epitome. You keep saying that. I'm sorry. Is it toxic though? Uh, I'd say so. Well, it's at least masculine. Yeah, um, it's very yeah, but very heterosexual. And yeah. So anyway, through the course of the story, she sleeps with so many people. She's a succubus. She literally has to do it to survive. And it's written into the story. I think that's an interesting way to go about it. Unfortunately, however, one of the big drawbacks, I think, of the show that really reveals this barely gay character trope. Uh, spoilers. Oh, yeah. Spoilers. Is the fact that no matter what happens, she always sticks around with the guy. Like, even if she tries to go away from him, he always ends up, their relationship always meets again. And even when they aren't actively dating, they always have this tension. And there's been several times throughout the show where, like, oh, they're not officially together, but they end up sleeping together anyway. And she also very visibly has a much harder time getting over him when they break up than she does any other relationship. Including the the one time that she ended up having a female girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And which, by the way, like, these characters were both present from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. She was with him for, like, three seasons before they decided to finally give the female a try. Oh, yeah. Which, personally, I felt well, they would have made a better relationship. It was on-again, off-again relationship between her and the guy, though. But... We, you could call from the very first time that they were the ones that the show wanted you to pit together. Mm-hmm. And from the very first episode where she did decide to uh, date the female, it was extremely obvious that they were going to break up, which eventually did happen. Exactly. And it was just so obvious in the way that they treated each other. And it became increasingly obvious as, you know, she acted like a terrible girlfriend to this other woman. And she wasn't that way when she was with the man. She just wasn't. Their yeah. relationship was portrayed as perfect. Yes. And so this, so the relationship, I just feel like, is extremely written to be hetero. Like, no matter who she's with, no matter how, how uh, you know, flagrant she is with sleeping with everybody, he, the, the man, is loyal. He does not sleep with anyone else because he truly loves her. And you're supposed to care about that. Even mm-hmm. though, really, she could do better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she can definitely do better than him. Yeah, so I just, the entire relationship seems forced. And w- I won't go too deep into this today, but literally every single female on the show wears high heels. That will be literally almost an entire episode in itself, most likely. <laughs> we, yeah, we might want to talk about that one day. Yeah. But if every ca- female character in the show wears heels, when some of them are literally like supposed to be strong and kicking butt, then you know the writers are male. Yeah, and not only that... Actually, we didn't actually look up what the writer's name was to determine if they were actually a (laughs) male. No, we didn't look that up. But it seems pretty obvious that a woman did not have a hand in writing. Or, I mean, I can't really say because I didn't look it up, but uh, it does seem to be a bit revealing about the audience they have in mind. Mm Mm-hmm. And the same-sex scenes like when she's having sex with the girl are so gratuitous oh there's literally even one scene where she's dating this other guy just for like a little while she was dating this other guy and he comes home with another woman saying here got you a present and then they have a three-person intercourse scene and like that is so insulting right it's like oh my god yes they she's bisexual so she must be into threesomes well, I mean, she is, but y- yeah, no, but it was is, it was portrayed okay. like like he was like, oh, here's a present for you because I know you like women too. Like, are you kidding me? That was you entirely will, for his benefit. Yeah, you will get just as much, if not more, enjoyment out of this being with two women. Mm-hmm. Do not act like this was anything selfless. Yeah, exactly. So I, I hated that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was one of the evil mythological creatures. Yeah, he was Loki actually. Yeah, he was Uh, a trickster. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that was my reference. You have another example? Mm Mm-hmm. In this series called Danganronpa, which is an anime, a video game, and, like, has a bunch of other stuff, there was a character called Mikon who talks about her beloved all the time. And later on, it's revealed or heavily suggested that her beloved is a woman, a girl, 
and the entire time you meet her is the scenes where she accidentally does stuff and it shows off very much for the male characters. It's like technically she's supposed to be in love with a woman, but the entire time she is performing for the male gaze and it's portrayed as accidental, but really she's just very pr a promiscuous character and she even offers sexual favors to men once. By the way, she never offers the same thing to female characters. She just never does. So, yeah. Okay, I actually just looked it up. Sorry, I know this isn't related to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. While you were talking, I looked up whether Lost Girl was written by women, and it seems to actually have a cast of both females and male writers. Oh, okay. But um, I... I think it's important to mention that even if writers do have good intentions, they still have their executives and their producers to deal with. Yes. So even if we were wrong about the having female writers thing, I still feel it caters to the male gaze. Oh, yes. I completely agree. And did you finish talking about Mekon? I'm sorry. I was a little y distracted. Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. Did you say who, who her beloved was? I said it was a girl. I didn't say specifically who it was. Okay. Yeah. Might as well not give spoilers if we don't have to. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. Oh, can I do the uh, Harry Potter? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, you guys know what Harry Potter is? It's like this. It's this seven-part book series. Uh, I think they also made some movies on it. Nine right? movies now. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little popular. <laughs> it's a little, a little cult classic kind of thing. I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, you guys know Dumbledore, right? He's the famous wizard, Harry's mentor, and all that. Oh. Ooh. Spoiler. Bleep. You think that's funny? It was a huge joke. Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's... I'm bleeping that out. Okay, fine. I'm bleeping that out. Okay. Um, she was just trying to spoil something. Like, it's not even... Rel we don't even need okay. to talk about that. Okay, fine. So, anyway. Apparently, Dumbledore is gay. Apparently. If you read the books... If you watch the movies, this might be of some surprise to you because nowhere in the entirety of the books nor the movies does it ever even suggest that he is gay. It is not part of his character. He doesn't, does, I, I don't, I don't recall him having a romance at all. The one mention. No, no. I'm not done yet. I'm sorry, okay, Kara. Okay. But, uh, so anyway, after all the books have been written, after at least most of the movies were out, the author, J.K. Rowling, decides to, she does this thing online where she'll answer questions about like her ideas for the, uh, the universe and what's uh, part of it and what's not. People ask some questions, and that's cool and all, but at the end of the day, that's just what like, she's thinking. She could very easily say something that, that isn't, true or present in the books mm -hmm. she could even contradict herself hypothetically well she says that dumbledore is gay i have a problem with that because if dumbledore was really gay why didn't you write that why does that not appear in the books anywhere the one time there was even a single hint or suggestion that he was gay was in the very last book when they put an excerpt of uh, Rita's, Rita Skeeter's book she wrote on Dumbledore, and in there she writes about the relationship between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. And that is literally... An, an evil male wizard. Yes. And that is the only time it is ever even suggested because Rita Skeeter suggests in the excerpt that... Uh, about their relationship, but she never even explicitly says that she thinks they might have been more than friends or anything like that. It's just yeah. kind of hinted at that their relationship blinded Dumbledore to Grindelwald's uh, evil ways. I mean, look, I think an author can give insight about uh, what they were planning, but it, I think it says a lot, the fact that even if she did imagine Dumbledore as gay and that helped formulate that scene... That, that that passage when the, she talked about that in the book. Mm -hmm. Even if that was the case, it's still she still wasn't committed enough to actually do it. She 
apparently light, subtle hints to her counted as confirmation of Dumbledore's orientation. You know what I mean? Like, like if Dumbledore was truly gay, then why couldn't you say that in the books? Now, if you're going to argue that the books just weren't about that, so, like, why would it be mentioned? I'm going to mention the fact that the Fantastic Beasts series, the next movie, is going to be about the crimes of Grindelwald. And they will have a young Dumbledore in that movie. And you know what was said by the director of that movie? That Dumbledore will not be explicitly gay in that movie. Okay, I mean, I was going to get to that. Uh, basically, okay, my problem is, if he was gay all along, you should have put that in there. You didn't put that in there, so that doesn't make him gay. That just, at best, opens the possibility, and we only even know to look there because she mentioned it after the fact. So mm -hmm. that, to me, is the very definition of being non-committal about a, char a character's orientation. So as far as I'm concerned, Dumbledore is not gay. Because we have not been able to see that. He could be. He could be. But that doesn't mean he is. You, yes. You get it? Mm -hmm. But you're right. They're having this new movie. And it's a prequel where you get to see his past. This would be a great opportunity to turn that could into a reality. Yes, because if you're going to write about the relationship, relationship between Dumbledore and Grindelwald, then that is the perfect time to indicate that it was more than just a friendship. Yeah, because that, that's the thing I, I feel about works of art. You know, if you want him to be gay, then write him to be gay. You got a movie coming out. There's your chance to write him to be gay. Mm -hmm. and, and so I feel like that's a huge missed opportunity. And I feel it's even a little insulting. Like, she didn't have to come out and say that, right? Well, she wasn't the one that said the thing about the movie, a director of the movie. No, 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 but, but Dumbledore being gay. Oh, yes. Like, she kind of started this whole mess. Mm -hmm. Because if she had just led it up to a subtle hint that could be interpreted multiple ways, it'd be inconclusive, right? Mm -hmm. People could talk about it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And then the movie would come out and it would come and go based on its conclus inconclusiveness. But she decided to call out attention to it as if it was fact. Yes. And, w and she would stand by it when challenged. Yet, when this movie comes out, Again, she won't commit. Exactly. And it's not like she wanted it, but the directors refused or something. She's perfectly fine with it not being in there. She wrote the screenplay for this movie. Oh, okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Yo, he's definitely gay. And then all of a sudden, well, we may not have shown that he was gay, but he definitely is. But we're also never going to show it. Or at least we have no plans on showing it. That is, to me, like the very definition of what this trope is. Out of all the characters we have on this list, I think Dumbledore best represents the barely gay character. Mm -hmm. just, just gay enough for people who wanted some gay representation in the Harry Potter series. But not gay enough to actually show it. Yeah. Are there any other gay characters? Do you know? I do not believe so. Yeah, there just aren't, are there? I do. I do. Don't it, think so. it seems like an attempt to retcon diversity into your book series. Yeah. Which is, again, one of the reasons we list at the top of the show for why people do that. Mm -hmm. they, go, they go through their series and realize, oh, we don't have enough diversity. Yeah. You could have at least done the... Oh, you're writing a prequel. Like, that's like the best time to retcon something is when you're writing a prequel. Exactly. Okay. Um, you can go next. <laughs> My bad. I didn't mean to rant so much about Dumbledore. It's just that one. Uh, I, I would really want to have a discussion about death of the author sometimes and whether an author has the right to declare whether something is or is not part of their universe. Mm -hmm. Maybe on another podcast. Yeah. Wow. That, that was impressive. What? What? <laughs> You're tired of talking about Dumbledore. Anyway, so the next character I want to talk about is Max Caulfield from uh, Life is Strange. She is bisexual. Oh wait, um, people might not know what this series is. Oh, it's a it's a video game. A series of them, right? Like episodes, episodic game. Yeah, it's an episodic game, and there is a prequel out now called Before the Storm. 
too. Okay. So there's two but episodic I, games. I haven't played that, so I can't really say. Yeah, me neither. But there are two episodic games. Yeah, And the main character, she's a uh, high school girl. Yeah. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the story of the game, she's a photographer. And if she finds out that through her photography, she can actually go back in time by going through the photos. No. Her photography has nothing to do with it. Did you play the game? Yes. Her photography has everything to do with it. What are you talking about? She she takes photos of the past and looks at them and can transfer to through them. No. Yes, she can. That doesn't Don't you remember happen. when she's tied up by the by the serial killer and she has to open the notebook to look at her fo- photographs to go to an earlier time? But how does that explain at the beginning when she just moves her hand? Oh, well, it's not the only way she time travels, but that's oh, how okay. that's how she can go long distances. Oh, without I see. without photographs, she can only go like a few minutes at a time. Oh, okay, I see, I see. I apologize. Sorry, I I, I guess I explained the more convoluted way before I explained the easier way. Yes. <laughs> um. Anyway. Uh, Max Caulfield's best friend is Chloe Pierce, who oh. is a lesbian. Oh, and she actually she's the one who ends up introducing her to her time travel powers. Oh yes, definitely. Should we spoil that? Or it's not yeah, important. Yeah. yeah, it's not important. No, okay. And she also has a new friend in the school she's going to called Warren because she she's basically starting a new school, a um, more artistic school, an a boarding school. And that for is for her photography. Mm-hmm. And that is how she ends up moving and meeting this old friend, Chloe, who used to be her friend. Okay, okay. And then she has a new best friend called Warren, who is a guy who is, of course, in love with her and also her best friend. And he is the epi- Is he her best epi- friend? I thought Chloe was her best friend. Well, she wasn't that good, close to Chloe because. Well, they just drifted she- apart. Yeah, they had just drifted apart, and in that meantime, she had become friends with Warren because right. he was actually in her school. Okay. Yes. So anyway, she reconnects with Chloe, and Warren is also an option for her, and he's basically the epitome of the nice guy, the best friend who thinks that because he's nice to her, that he should get a shot at dating her. And she can either date him or be with Chloe. The way they write Warren is... He's possessive. Yes, exactly. He, he's the kind of friend, he's like, oh, I've been your best friend the whole time. Why Therefore, won't you give me a shot at dating you? You owe me this kind of thing. Yes. Which is very problematic. Mm-hmm. Chloe obviously doesn't do this. She's a great friend to Max. So... It seems like they just put Warren in to have a heterosexual option. Yes, because remember I said Chloe is is integral to the plot. She through her you learn your time travel powers. Mm-hmm. And there's a huge decision you have to make at the end of the game that changes the outcome for everybody. Mm-hmm. But it centers on what you do with her. Do you save her or not save her? Mm-hmm. And so, like, the entire game is based around Max's relationship with Chloe. And then there's this other guy. Yeah. It literally seems like just a hetero option. Mm-hmm. Because you can kiss Chloe, like... And him. And Warren. And, and Yeah, Warren. Yeah. But, yeah. And it's just... Like, Chloe is an old friend, and they have a very detailed and intricate relationship with each other throughout this entire game that is like the main part of the story and then warren is just kind of the best typical best friend who's in love with her trope and keep in mind max is not necessarily bi because it really depends on your actions that you take when playing as her oh yes It, it it allows for the option of someone who's playing the game that even though this game is written about a relationship between two young women which would, under um, some player circumstances, be a gay relationship. It allows the opportunity for some people to be like, nah, I'm not into that. I'm going to instead be hetero with this guy over here. Exactly. I didn't even think of it like that. The fact that the entire story centers around this relationship between these two girls. Mm-hmm. 
And and I, I you could you could have that type of ending while at the same time choosing to not save Chloe. So mm-hmm. you could have a like a basically a super hetero ending, mm-hmm. which the reason I find it problematic is because of how integral the story leans towards the the female relationship. They're two very well written characters, mm-hmm. and then you got this jerk over here that seemed really like an afterthought. Yes, because is he's not integral to the story in any way, is he? I do not I, recall. Like, you, you bump into him a few times, but he doesn't affect anything. Mm-mm. He doesn't define you, yet he acts like like you owe him something. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't mean to take the limelight from you. I just... No, I'm glad you have a lot to say about this. I can just say that Max Caulfield is a... Like, I like her for being a actual bisexual character, but... <sighs> The way this was written is just like she's either straight or gay, I guess you could say. Well, no, you can actually kiss both of them. Oh, really? Yes, but like if you kiss Chloe uh, later on, like in the dream sequence, it's like, wow, you're super into Chloe and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like like they really play up the uh, like Max's inner thoughts. But if you kiss Warren, it does the opposite with him. Oh. If you kiss both of them, then they're both there just arguing about you. Oh, wow. So it's like, you can choose to be bi, but you still end up focusing on Chloe. Yeah, okay. Because she's still the center of the plot. Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing ever even happens with Warren after that kiss, really. Yeah, all right. Okay, you done? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So now, okay, our last example is two examples in one. And this might come out of nowhere for you guys, but we're going to talk about the gay characters in the Mario franchise. Well, not gay. The barely gay. (laughs) Super Mario. So the first one we want to talk about is Birdo. You guys might have seen Birdo. Birdo is one of the common characters to be used in the the party games or or even some racing games. Yeah, yeah, she was in some of the racing games. And... Birdo was originally designed in Super Mario Bros. 2. Oh, by the way, if you were wondering, like, what is Birdo? It's the pink dinosaur thing that shoots the eggs out of the hole in its face. And has a bow. Red bow. Yes. And she's, uh, she's pink. Did I say that? Mm-hmm. Uh, Birdo is just a Birdo named Birdo. Just like how Yoshi's a Yoshi named Yoshi. Mm-hmm. And Birdo was originally designed in Super Mario Bros. 2 as a male character. Birdo was male, but was pink and wearing a bow because Birdo was a cross-dresser. Mm-hmm. That was the character design. You can read this in the pamphlets. However, when Super Mario Bros. 2 came over to America, they just kind of didn't mention any of that. And yeah. then in every subsequent appearance of Birdo, they've referred to Birdo as a she now, mm-hmm. even though Birdo's original appearance was male. So the thing is, though, Birdo has a relationship with Yoshi. It's, it's a heavily implied one. They're always paired together and given provocative names. Like some games will give team names based on couples you choose. So like, like Mario and Peach are called like the perfect couple. And uh, even like, like Daisy is said to be the Peach to Luigi. <laughs> Stuff like that. Like there's not a super deep story in these games, but there's enough there that you can see what they're going for. Exactly. And Yoshi and, and Birdo are always paired together. Yoshi being a male dinosaur and Birdo now being considered female, but Birdo was originally considered male. Because of that, some people uh, interpret Birdo to be transgender. If you consider the fact that Birdo was male in one game and female in another. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, that, I mean, that's a fair interpretation. Mm-hmm, I agree. But, Yeah, it feels like Nintendo was trying to do something there. They thought it might have been funny as a joke or something. I don't know what their intentions were. But whatever it was, they immediately backpedaled. Yeah, they immediately uh, censored it for the Western audience. It's worth noting, though, that there is one game on the Wii. It was, uh, it wasn't Captain Falcon, Captain Rainbow, I think. Anyway, it was some game on the Wii where Birdo was a character and you could find some incriminating evidence for Birdo. And Birdo would, like, want it back from you. Mm-hmm. In classic Nintendo fa- fashion, it doesn't tell you exactly what this is. Okay. But it's implied to be something incriminating about Birdo's gender. Oh, wow. Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> now, the other character we wanted to talk about from the Mario franchise was a character called Vivian in the Paper Mario franchise. In the Japanese version, it specifically well, we, said... We should go, we say who Vivian is. Oh, okay. Vivian, Vivian is what's called a Shadow Siren. Mm-hmm. And uh, Vivian is one of the three main henchmen for the Shadow Queen, which is like this big phantom queen that once ruled the land. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Shadow Sirens are all relatives of each other that work for the Shadow Queen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's, there's your setup. In the Japanese version of the game, it explicitly says in Vivian's description that she is a, that she's actually a boy who presents he, as, <laughs> he's actually a boy that presents as female to fit in with his sisters. Because the, the other sirens are all female and so is the queen, but he's a, he's a, he's male. Mm-hmm. And it's also said that he gets bullied by his sisters for this. Well, in the game, Vivian gets bullied the entire time. That's why Vivian oh, yeah. actually ends up becoming one of your partners when Mario jumps in and helps Vivian out despite being enemies. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that was to me like one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the game, watching watching Vivian get bullied. Yeah. But it, when when the game was released in America, they decided to just completely change that. They changed Vivian to being female. Mm-hmm. And there was a very specific reason. Because having a male be effeminate, watch anime. That happens all the time, even in American audiences. People sometimes even think it's funny as a, as a, as a sort of joke. So that in itself wasn't the problem. You know what the real problem was? What? At the end of the game, Vivian kisses Mario as a thank you. Oh, yeah. And Nintendo felt that they could not leave a male character kissing their male hero. Oh, yeah. I completely forgot about that. Especially because Vivian means it. Vivian is one of the female, sorry, uh, one of the characters that likes Mario. Mm -hmm. Now, but Vivian's the only one that is male, or at least originally was until Vivian was retconned into being female in Mm -hmm. the Western release. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's two examples of transgender characters. That... Well, not, not 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 transgender. Like I mean, Birdo, sure, you can make that argument, but Vivian is just male or female depending on which side of the world you live in. Yeah, because of censorship. Yeah, that's true, actually. So, but I think that's a barely gay character because basically you made a gay character in Vivian, but then you did you couldn't commit to it and you decided to dial it back for the Western release and just make it a hetero thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so those are the examples that we decided to tee up for you. Now, uh, Kira did also come up with some examples of some really good representations that we just kind of wanted to show you uh, as a uh, comparison so that you can see what the difference is between these problematic characters and depictions of uh, not really committing to having a gay character. And, uh, what, and so you can see what a good depiction is. I want to point out, before, before you go, Kira, I'm sorry, I, I want to point out that having a character that its orientation doesn't care about is understandable. You might have other things you want to focus on. But while that may not be a bad representation, it's not really a good one either. Mm-hmm. It's just neutral. And you can have characters that just mention their orientation in passing, and they're like in some type of fantasy world where no one cares about that. I mean, sometimes you can have a circle of friends that don't care about it, but the world does judge you kind of harshly. Mm-hmm. So while that's, that is good, it would be nice if that was reality for everybody. It simply isn't. So really the best way to have a good representation of a gay character is for them to be proudly gay as opposed to just being casually gay. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah, I understand. What casually you mean. gay is still a good representation, but we can do better. Yeah. So, okay, going through examples, I'll stop talking. I just wanted to <laughs> disclaimer. Okay. Some really good examples of LGBT representation are a British show called Orphan Black, which has like three separate characters that are may two of them are like actually proudly their orientation and they actually get into same sex relationships during the series. And that's uh, Kasima and Felix. And Sarah is just kind of passively bisexual. So. Yeah. It should be noted that the characters are clones. Some are gay, some are not. 
Take that as you will. Yes. Okay. And one of the best representations of a lesbian relationship we've ever seen is an episode of Black Mirror called San Junipero, which you might have heard of. It got really popular. Yeah. I mean, it has this whole type of uh, really mind-bending plot to it. But all the while, there's two. it's about two women that meet each other using a technology that would have not normally met each other, and they just... They fall in love, and it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a really great episode of Black Mirror. I highly recommend that. Now, this trope of barely gay characters is only a small part of a huge lack of representation, including other tropes like barrier gays, where LGBT characters just don't get to live. As much as heterosexual characters. I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, but I remember reading once that like gay characters were like four times more likely to die than any other character. Yes. And um, another aspect of this is bad representation and bad storytelling. Like, for example, I'm bisexual and Bo from Lost Girl makes me feel bad about being represented in media because... I mean, yeah, she's bisexual, but she's portrayed in such a bad light sometimes with her, you know, having threesomes and her whole relationship with Dyson constantly pining over him. And Yeah, it really trivializes it. Yeah, it trivializes her bisexuality. Uh-huh. That's That's actually a good summation of what I was trying to say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I actually did some research, and we've been getting kind of better, a little better about representation. Basically, this past TV year, 2017 through 2018, 4.8% of TV characters like primetime television and popular series are LGBT characters. Wait, is that characters that are are, uh, identifying with that, or... Is that shows that have those characters? It's a show that has those characters. Okay, because even in those shows, there could be like just one character, but the rest are all hetero. That's how it almost always is. Yeah, maybe two, so that there's can be a gay relationship. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, so okay, so four point eight percent of all shows have any gay characters or any any LGBT characters, Mm -hmm. right? But but. That's like saying 4.8% of the time we have a LGBT character 2% of the time. Because we don't have the numbers on each of those shows, but how much you want to bet the percentages of the LGBT characters are in each of those shows, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) But uh, now this is hard to get numbers on because people aren't very willing to admit this. It's estimated that as much as 10% of this uh, the nation po- nation's population is LGBT. America. Yes, America. And that is, you know, subjective because it's really hard to get numbers on that. But even if it is 10%, that's like literally only half representation in media. It's, it's only half getting a or, or one or two characters on a show. Yeah. And, you know, movies do even worse than, uh, than TV shows. Oh, yes. I can definitely say that. Yeah. I mean, I, we don't have the numbers on that, but I mean, I'm telling you, it's true. TV shows are able to get away with a lot more progressive content because they are uh, not as heavily regulated by, you know, big Hollywood studios. Mm-hmm. So anything else you want to say? Um... I just hope that we get better with this representation. And for example, the movie Love, Simon is a step in the right direction. So hopefully we get more of that. All right. Well, I think this would be good. Uh, if you guys want to contact us, you can email us or go to any of our social media. We got basically all of them. So just check it out. You can find the links on wherever you see this thing at. Bye. Bye. Bye.